welcome to the Grandland video blog for books that came out on May 20th, 2009. I'm Craig, your host. This is part three of three where you'll find our DC books this week. If you're looking for our indie books, they're back in part two with some Marvel reviews. And then if you're looking for the Marvel reviews, they're in part two and in part one as usual. You can watch those wherever you're watching this one. YouTube, Facebook, MySpace, ProjectFanboy.com. And don't forget our special reviews at BaitenByBooks.com. A special one coming out this week about Dresden Files number three. This is our DC review, so without further ado, let's get to some DC stuff. We're going to start with something a little unorthodox. Uh, I picked up the Booster Gold 52 Pickup Trade Paperback. I know this is uh, older material, and it's already been in hardcover. They've taken their sweet, sweet time getting it out in trade paperback form, and it's finally here, and I was very excited to check it out. I missed it in these single issues, and I obviously didn't want to pay hardcover price, so we went with the trade paperback here. Jeff Johns, uh, Jeff Katz, and Dan Jurgens deliver a very unique premise. If you haven't heard about it yet... Um, Basically, Booster has to team up with Rip Hunter, the Time Master, and go through time and seal up these little anomalies that happen. So basically, we get to write Booster Gold into uh, scenes that happen throughout DC history. You know, we go back to Ted Kord's death. We go back to Batgirl uh, being shot, Barbara Gordon being shot by the Joker. We go back to various little things. It's very interesting, and I've always liked the idea of a time travel story that's not really exactly linear, but, but all of this stuff. But the nice twist is you take a character like Booster Gold, who is all about you know, logos and commercial endorsements and, you know, uh, expensive, you know, commercial money uh, and getting glory and recognition and turning that into cash. And you take him and you put him into a situation where he has to be like a secret hero. He has to operate, uh, do all these great things that nobody's ever really going to know. It's a nice twist to the Booster Gold story. So excellent, solid stuff. It's good to see that he didn't just catch a bullet in his head or go evil like most of the JLI did. So, good stuff if you haven't seen that, and affordable as well, 15 bucks for the first six issues. Very nice. Let's move on to the floppies and start with Batman Battle for the Cowl number three of three. Um, this wraps it up quite nicely, I think. Uh, I was a little worried about how Tony Daniel was going to take this after the second issue. It seemed kind of like the second issue was lacking. The first issue was a good setup, and the second issue didn't really go where we needed it to go. But part three is back. Uh, obviously, Jason Todd is the gun-toting Robin or the gun-toting Batman, and I think that the res the resolution here, uh, spoilers aside, um, I th there's been a lot of talk about how it's not as clear as I think it is. I think it's very clear as to who Batman has become. Um, it's subtle. It's not you know clearly, absolutely, explicitly stated, but. Uh, if you're paying attention to the book, I think it goes exactly where it needs to go, and the right person ends up wearing the mantle. And you get to see some very interesting things. Uh, you know, but without tipping the whole hand, we get to see that there's somebody apparently not actually Black Mask, but actually taking off the Black Mask. Uh, we don't know who exactly that is, who's going to be manipulating the whole story. So that's a nice thing to explore going forward out of here as the Batman books resume. It was a nice little hiatus, and it's a solid three-part miniseries. Um, did it really need to be set up this way? No, but it is DC, but you know, it is what it is, and it's a good three issue miniseries at that. Tony Daniel did some great job writing and excellent job on the art as well. And it looks great, and it'll fit very well into the mythology of this is the book where so and so becomes Batman. So, very nice stuff uh, all around. I guess it was Morbid Curiosity that directed me to Final Crisis Aftermath Dance. <laughs> Uh, I, I really can't say for sure. But I've been a fan of Chris Cross's art for a long time, and I decided, hey, uh, at, at worst, I get to see Chris Cross's art again. And the story is very nice. Uh, it's interesting to see these characters kind of over the top cliches, you know, um, most excellent Super Bat and Atomic Lantern Boy and, and whatever they call them all. And the, the chick that looks like a schoolgirl is like Lolita Sailor Moon or something like that, you know. Funny, funny things, and I think this was kind of a groundwork that Morrison laid with the Great Ten when he uh, decided to name his Chinese superheroes and funny, like, you know, like how you would translate Chinese to English or Japanese to English with, you know, s most excellent super bat is a great example, or the super young team, you know, and, and then uh, the Great Ten kind of ended up over there, so I think Morrison decided, well, we might as well make another one. Let's call it the super young team. Let's go with that. It's funny. It's fun. Um, the, it's just a lot of just tongue-in-cheek over the top it reminds me of the old days when i was about 15 16 years old and we play uh, like a marvel superheroes role-playing game you know what we wanted to do we wanted 
spend all of our time building a trophy room and make this crazy orbiting satellite headquarters or this huge headquarters and you know and and these characters actually are thinking you know unlike their publicist they're going okay well when are we going to fight the bad guys but the publicist is thinking like my 16 year old character would have thought which is all right i've got a you know giant you know mansion with you know, we could do cribs in my, you know, superhero base, and I've got a trophy room and a simulator room, and I'm making sure to put all these cool little things in it. And then we never really considered fighting bad guys. But uh, it's an interesting look at that, very tongue-in-cheek, very fun. Um, excellent, excellent book, far exceeded my expectations, and it's $2.99, and it's a six-issue miniseries. It'll be really good, I think. It's going to be fun. A first-time review for this blog, Tiny Titans number 16. Um, my boss has been ordering this for his children for a long time and I decided, you know, let's give it a try. I like kids' books. I'm a sucker for that. Um, excellent stuff. The cover leads you to believe that this is a Supergirl versus Kid Flash, which would have been a really good idea in and of itself, but the entire team is in a race. Um, and, it's, and it also works out fairly well. There's, the gym instructor is Lobo. I, I had no idea that that was going on in Tiny Titans. Had I known, I would have been here a while ago. This is hilarious. It's great stuff. Uh, it delivers for kids, but at the same time, there's enough winks and nods to adult knowledge of Teen Titans and of the DC Universe to really make it interesting. So it's a great book, and it's only $2.50. So when you're done reading it as an adult, you can go, all right, well, it's never going to be worth anything. I'm going to give it to my kids or my nephews or nieces, whoever you, whoever you have that could enjoy comic books. You can turn them on to comic books when you're done reading it. So solid stuff all around. That's my plan for it. Oh, we get to the bottom of the pile. This is usually where I say last but not least, but I think this is where we say last and least is Vigilante number six. Whew, I can smell it from here and it's already polybagged. This is the conclusion of the Death Trap. Marv Wolfman, uh, for I would say half of the book, writes a good Vigilante story. You see uh, Jericho and Deathstroke fighting it out in the corner, you know, and Vigilante's trying to decide when he's going to get the kill shot. That's what Vigilante's supposed to be about, and that's where Marv Wolfman ex excels at what he does. And again, this is a Blue Goblin callback. If you've seen Blue Goblin, he threw it in the trash, kind of like I did with uh, Uncanny X-Men in Part 1. Um, I've got my own interesting fate for it, but uh, it, it's... It, it's, it's, it seems like Marv Wolfman wanted to do something good, but he's just been suckered into this crossover, so he can't. He just can't pay it off. It's just it's not going to work. So he takes it in his own unique direction, you know, and, and all of a sudden has to go in and tie in the Teen Titans thing. Surprise! Remember when the Teen Titans blew up last week? Yeah, they're all, they're all still alive. Raven just faked it. It was just an illusion. She faked the whole thing. She even faked it so well that after she left, the illusions were still there on the floor, so Cyborg freaked out and thought they were all dead anyway. Uh, and, you know, she didn't have to be in the same room. Of course, that's not how it, uh, Raven's power works, but who told Sean McKeever that? Who cares about powers? So we're going to take a very special trip over here. We're going to take the camera, because that's always fun. We're going to go on a little trip. Uh, there's nobody in here, thank goodness. So we're going to go over here. Oh yeah, that's the bathroom. You better believe it. Uh, we're going to knock on the door. We're going to go in. You can stay out here. I've got a mic so you can still hear me. And we're going to go in here and we're going to go like this. Oh yeah. Oh, I think it's clogged. Oh man. Alright, well, uh, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.